DA21-0010 requires a little bit of understanding about the history of what's gone on with the owners and the addresses involved. So I've done up a little table here. For those that may not be as familiar with the circumstances as others, I'm going to try and keep it as brief and simple as possible. Now, the current table that we have in DA21 is this table over here that's actually got the Crown lands included in it. This little table here was the one that was given out to potential investors last year, even up to the end of last year, until it was changed and certain things were added. We know this because of the versions that were actually recorded. There could have been a change done in October, I think. It may have been changed in October to that, or it may have been changed on the 22nd of December when version 5 of the Statement of Environmental Effects by Planet has been lodged as been amended. Now Planet have conveniently colour-coded everything. So before we get to DA21-0010 and even last year's version, you need to go back, well, probably five years. Five years minimum to say, let's say 2016, when 3222 was being run by Wollumbin Horizons Proprietary Limited. There were people that had come in, bought in as investors. These people are just looking at getting their funds refunded to them after the liquidation of Wollumbin Horizons. But as the time that they have been setting up in here, and before the community starts falling apart, Peter Van Lyshout over here with his Kemp Cove Proprietary Limited and Zimmerland has got a huge amount of land. In his DA 06-1054, he received approval to put in his village, but he never did anything and that lapsed in 2014. So by 2016, the only operating and valid development application in existence for Peter Van Lyshout on those properties is DA 94-0073 for the Misty Mountains Tourist Accommodation, which has got two cabins, 15 tent sites and amenities. So that's the only existing approval, well, and still is, when you come up to the current position today. DA 06-1054 lapsed without any work completing and as it lapsed, so did the consent. So it is neither e existing approval or consent. It is null and void because it was lapsed. So this land over here that belongs to Kemp Cove and Zimmerland who are solely owned and run by Peter Van Lyshout, received the development approval for the village. Nothing was done, it fell through. When Peter Van Lyshout saw them setting up over here, he approached them and said, do you want to join in? Let's do something together. Contracts were made and they merged. By 2017, Adrian Brennock is putting Wollumbin Horizons into liquidation and starting to set up and sell shares in this new merged factor that is still having Wollumbin Horizons as the listed owner, even after it has been sold at auction, even when it's been put into liquidation and it cannot actually represent to be the owner because it's in liquidation, the asset has been seized and it is now the control of the liquidator. So we have the two sections, this one here with Wollumbin Horizons and this one over here with Peter Van Lyshout that joined to make this. Now this purple bit in here is another bit of land. 
that at the time when Peter Van Lyshout set up or tried to set up and got the approval for DA 06-1054, he had different partners in this land parcel. And that can be noticed in the documents attached to DA 21-10. So it was at the same time when he merged with Wollumbin Horizons uh, that Dolph Cook and Darko Kovac came in to replace the investors that clearly wanted to get out. So here we have in 2021, and I'm not going to uh, discuss the current rumours about who wants to get rid of what land and then what are the questions of what happens with that land. We're just going to deal with what is proposed in the development application. So what they propose to do, this is the current situation here, where we've got Kemp Cove, Peter Van Lyshout, Dolph Cook, Darko, Darko Kovac, Zimmerland, NCV Enterprises and the Crown Lands. Now the Crown Lands are under offer of purchase, signed and being processed. So let's assume that they will be incorporated. For the most part, those crown lands or roads that actually go through are still on the same lot numbers as all of these uh, main lots are. So it would be a matter of containing that within that lot. So it will not mean the addition of any extra lot numbers, but it will mean the addition of 29.6 hectares to the 1,584.34 hectares that they say is actually currently the development. To be more correct about it, they should also include these two lots here, which by necessity actually form the boundary edges of the proposed development. Lot 4 actually forms part of Road 1 where they intend to upgrade and do road works on. So most definitely, this lot should actually be included. It has not. The lots that have been included total 21. With these two additional lots, there would be 23. But already on the 21 lots that they are incorporating, they have clearly stated 1,584.34 hectares plus 29.6 hectares of crown lands that they are purchasing, which means that the t total development is actually 1,613.94 hectares. So I hope you're following me here and that you're understanding where I'm in going with this. So the little table that I've done down here is actually a projection of what they want to achieve that Kemp Cove will be separate. It will have its own lot four that will still be held by Kemp Cove. This lot here, lot 34, will still be held by Peter Van Lyshout, Dolph Cook and Darko Kovac. And all the rest of the land, as advised in the uh, Statement of Environmental Effects by Planet on uh, page 14, I think it is, that all of these 16 lots that are owned by Zimmerland up here are going to be purchased, are actually under contract by NCV and that settlement on that contract is apparently happening in the near future. This is however something that has been said for several years so that in the near future could mean whenever. But whenever does happen, this is what they intend it to look like. So then once they've got it to that position, then what they intend to do is formulate it so that there are 11 separate titles. 10 will include uh, rural land sharing community lots and one will be a village. Now here in itself, is where their development application actually hits a few flaws because of this 
is the current position and this is the projected future position once the contract with Peter Van Lyshout through Zimmerland goes through they settle on that and all that land that was owned by Zimmerland is now owned by NCV Enterprises and all the Crown Roads are also within the envelopes of each of these lots now and is all part of the ownership by NCV Enterprises or Kemp Cove or the other ones, whichever ones they've bought to within that title. So this is the current position. This is the intended near future position. Then as I said, what they intend to do is take all of those what is essentially 21 lots, uh, 23 lots, not 21, but let's say it is 21. They intend to take those 21 lots and turn them into 11 separate titles. Now here's a little bit of a problem. Now this is the State Environmental Planning Policy 2019 New South Wales. I've discussed this before and I've also discussed that it's very clear that the provision is for a single lot with collective owners and multiple dwellings. And as a proviso of that being a single lot with uh, multiple dwellings and collective owners, subdivision is prohibited. So within the very state environmental planning policy for the conditions for a rural land sharing community to be um, upheld and applied under this policy. It must be a single lot and not subdivided. Now within the development application 2110 or 21-10 here in the Statement of Environmental Effects, you will see Planets Heading, Concept, Subdivision, Particulars. Now, let me remind you that this part says Subdivision Prohibited. So after they've put in Development Application 21-0010 that prohibits subdivision. They want approval to stick in the roads and then afterwards to actually subdivide those 21 lots into 11 lots so that they can put as many houses on there as they possibly can. Now this is in clear um, contradiction. The, the um, state environmental policy clearly states that subdivision is prohibited. It's three pages long. It's not that much for a town planner to understand that when it says subdivision prohibited, you certainly would not even word this table as concept subdivision because it's already just said it's prohibited. So here's what you'd actually have to do before you put in a development application. You would have to purchase those lands, uh, finish doing all of this, and then take your existing lots, turn them into 11 separate lots. Then you won't be proposing to do subdivision within a single lot RLSC. But once you've done that too, you've also got 11 lots. One of those will be for a village, so then 10 lots where you intend to put rural land sharing communities in. Now, as described, the SCP policy clearly states single lot. So if you want to have a maximum number of people, these 392, you would then have to put in 10 different development applications and each one of them being a single lot 
is fulfilling the requirements under the state environmental planning policy. Because as is, the proposal, once these multiple lots are changed ownership and shifted, the land's not changing, just who is owning it will change. So once they've moved that around, the next part is to subdivide it. This is concept subdivision particulars. This says subdivision prohibited. It is a contradiction of what is actually allowed within the state environmental planning policy for one lot that is collectively owned and has multiple dwellings on it and cannot be subdivided. So the only way that it can actually be applied for under the rural land sharing communities section under schedule five is once all those proposed lots are then made singular lots and they have a separate development application put in for each one of those rural land sharing communities by which time there may be the inability to actually have them in the Tweed Shire Council. But that is actually their problem at NCV Enterprises for jumping the gun and actually trying to get a multi-lot subdivision development put in under the guise of a rural land sharing community. And it has brought really a bad light onto those 13 existing rural land sharing communities that some, you know, struggle as human beings do. They make mistakes. It's a live and learn process. But, you know, some of them I've heard are, are having a fairly decent attempt at it. Others, well, yes, they could do with a little bit of polish. But the fact being that you cannot have a subdivision within a rural land share community. It's not permissible, it's prohibited. And yet this development application that is applying for consent for rural land sharing communities intends to subdivide. So I'm gonna leave it on that at this stage. I think I've said enough and made my point. There is, however, one further point I'll make in that over the years, anyone that's ever known anyone that's had a property where they've actually looked at getting the boundaries changed, what a nightmare it is just on one single lot, how much it actually costs. And council aren't very um, happy or cooperative to actually let you do things up front anyway because that means changing all the registered plans. Now they like to keep lots the way that they are and essentially for those 11 lots that they plan to make out of the 21 or 23 they have to get in surveyors, they have to survey off where all those sections would be all the registered plans at council then have to be amended and changed. And that is a lot of money, a lot of time. And just for one block, that is enough. But they're intending to do it with 21, turning it into 11. That is going to be a major headache. Something like that could take years to actually turn from the existing lots into the proposed lots. And there may even be issues that come up where you cannot do the proposed lots because it's a conf conflict of bylaws and how you can reduce certain land sizes in certain areas. I don't know, I haven't looked at it. But it's just one of those things that I thought I would mention anyway that it's not just a matter of, oh, look, you know, we're just going to go in and we're just going to change where the, the boundaries are and everything's fine. There's a huge process involved with it and also a lot of cooperation required from the council. 
considering they are not very nice to the council, I don't say. Well, they'll get cooperation anyway because the council are professionals. But let's just say that processes can be made easy or they can be drawn out because, you know, what a person coming in is just a... You just make them wait a little bit longer. <laughs> I'm kidding. They wouldn't do that. As I said, they're professionals. But we could dream, can't we? So before I get on to trying to get through just banging over a list of um, all the issues that have been noticed and picked up by myself and various other people, that um, the property development is 1,613.94 hectares. It is something that they are distinguishing in that they've had X amount of land owned by people and there's X amount in crown lands. But in essence, this whole bit that they intend to be the future, very near future, this should be happening either right now or in the very near future, there will be 1,613.94 hectares that make up this development application. So before it's actually been even lodged, there are inconsistencies and incorrect things. Because there was because there these these two lots are not mentioned within this, they would not have provided owner's consent because they would not have been requested. It's it's not part of the stated development. Likewise, they, were on, they only are asked to provide the details of title holders and permission and consent from them, not from anyone like the forestry that might actually hold the lease over the exclusive use of the plantation eucalypts. And the other lacking consent is from the supposed current 40 investors that have been brought in, coming in, they are not in these company vehicles. And yet, the people buying in, as per the documentation provided in DA 21-0010, it is under a shareholders agreement. Now, as a shareholder, you can only hold shares if it's a company. So, the shares have to be held by the people buying in in one of these companies that owns the land. There has been no increase in shareholders for the said number of investors. And if people have actually invested money without being made a shareholder in NCV Enterprises, you have got no legal title over it and you're going to find yourself much like the investors with Wollumbin Horizons and their trusteed the draft that became a supposed well they tried to register it but it couldn't be registered because it was inadequate and thereby there was no deed or agreement to protect the people that had invested their money. It ended up in court. Now, as the shareholders' agreement is the agreement said to be used to be buying into, you need to be in one of these company vehicles and have an equal share, as is required that of the story, that uh, everybody has equal sh share and right. It is, it is said that people will have a shareholders' agreement, but these people own the land. They have the legal right to it. And the only people that have legal right to this land are these people that are noted here and are shareholders in the companies that own that land. If you've paid those shareholders money without becoming a shareholder in the company, you are at grave risk. Well, you are not at grave risk risk you all you are already in a position where you have got no legal footing somebody 
can just take your money now and you've got no way to prove that the, that the land was yours, that this was what you were supposed to get. This is what they found out in Wollumbin Horizons. Now I might point out that Wollumbin Horizons Proprietary Limited is, was, still is Adrian Brennock. And now we find that NCV Enterprises has got shares with uh, Nyepi, the one that he put the shares into his wife's name just prior to bankruptcy. Uh, Nyepi holds shares in NCV Enterprises and the major shareholder in NCV Enterprises is uh, Yudaki Capital or one of those ones and Nyepi is a shareholder in the major shareholder Yudaki of NCV Enterprises. So Adrian Brennock, the man that started up here, all the lost failed investors threw this company into a fire sale and start selling the next one to people while these ones are left with nothing. Then in June, Adrian Brennock and Mark McMurtry stand outside 3222 and say, we bought it back. We bought it back. Now the only essence that has changed is the legal title of who holds the land from the Lumban Horizons to NCV Enterprises, but they both represent exactly the same people. And what is particularly noted too, that Peter Van Leishout actually conducted some form of community consultation. Whereas NCV Enterprises have not only not conducted any community consultation, but anyone in the community that does dare to say anything against the development, they have a solicitor to threaten for that. You know, shut up or we'll sue you. You'll end up like Gillian Norman and we'll take you for everything you've got. This is actually a common brag of Mark McMurtry especially. You know, we're going to take everything that you've got. Adrian Brunox even said it to me that he's going to take everything that I don't have. <laughs> but that's their mentality. Shut up, we're going to sue you for everything that you've got. These people are takers and bullies. Now the first thing I'm actually going to raise is the absence of any bridge work mentioned in this stage one cost, cost estimate. Where is the bridge work? The bridge work is essential to get to the roads, the 26 and a half kilometres that they want to upgrade has to have heavy vehicles, machinery reach it which means that they have to go over the bridges on the river to get to it. There are three bridges. What do they intend to do with the bridges? And they can't just keep using Mandalay Road. This is not a main thoroughfare for the community. This is actually a private road. And as I said, not a thoroughfare for Nightcap on Minjimbal. The main entrance, the village entrance, the bridge is in shocking condition and uh, well, it would be questionable whether it could actually carry an unloaded truck, let alone a loaded truck, especially a truck carrying an excavator or something like that. It might end up in the river. And the other part up here that actually says that items shown in this schedule do not form part of the lump sum contract but are given for indication and guidance regarding the extent of work. Now, if it's not forming part of the lump sum contract, then what is the total cost of the estimated works in stage one? Because you see, there's a very big difference that if you are over a certain so many million dollars in your development application, 
it automatically goes to the regional panel. Now, under that, it reverts and stays with the local authority. So you would actually wonder, has this been padded out to bring it up to a dollar value that would actually exceed the boundary required or the minimum required for the national region, regional um, uh, panel to look at it. If they had only included the cost of what they actually intend to do in stage one, which is around 21 million, if you consider the roadworks and the telecommunications cabling that will go in with that roadworks, that's 21 million. Now, I'm not sure on this, but it has been said that 30 million may actually be the point where a development automatically goes to the National Regional Panel. So the question is, if the expenditure in excess of 21 million is something that is a projected cost that will be borne by people individually as they move in, is this actually fair to include it in the cost estimates? Should they not also include the cost of them building houses as well and putting in their own driveways and putting in a garage and all these other things? Because if they're going to project the future expenses of the investors and the people that are going to be using all these lots for exclusive use, these costs do not form part of the development or the construction costs. It's part of the individual's costs in setting up their home, as any individual would. There is also where would they actually project here 392 soil tests and planning applications to the council for approval? Would they project all the costs forward for all that and include it in here? Or are these projections merely to meet the requirements of how you would provide basic services and infrastructure like water, electricity and sewerage? So if by the inclusion of the projection forward of what owners or investors will incur, this is not an infrastructure that the developers will bear the cost of. Unless they have actually clearly stated that it is something that they will supply. As you buy in, we will give you two water tanks, a Tolex system and this solar supply, solar panel and battery backup system. That's all included. That has not actually been stated in anything that I've actually seen that is offered to potential investors. You get the exclusive use of land, the rest is up to you to do. Thereby, the cost of that is also up to you. You may not want to put in a tailex system, you may want to put in a, combust um, a compostable toilet. So ultimately, the choices are going to be individual and they are going to be individual costs, not the costs of the construction. So around, uh, what was it, 16 million has been projected as the construction costs for infrastructure, basic services that investors will actually provide for themselves when they buy in and they set up their own houses. This is actually not uh, a capital expenditure program that involves $37 million. It is actually only $21 million. Might get up to the required amount if they did some bridge works, but um, we do not know what's going on with the bridges. I don't know, maybe they're a part of a separate development application that is also in some you know, secret land that we're not allowed to know. Now this is the water catchment overlay. 
the water catchment water in many forms is actually a very big concern with this development. The grey water, the storm water, what goes off in that storm water washes off down into the water catchment. The dusty roads, any herbicides or roundup that's used to kill the weeds and maintain them. There's just, and the grey water from the DSTP or the uh, sewerage treatment plants, all of them washing off in heavy rains. Then there may be also other contaminants for what 392 different um, places might actually have in their yards. You know, it's not uncommon to see cars dumped. It's not uncommon to see rubbish dumped. Unfortunately, that might actually be more of a problem with this property than what would normally be anywhere else simply because of the two designated caretakers of the NCV Enterprises side. We've got Mark McMurtry who took over from his Wollumbin Horizons and Buller Buller days and on the PVL or Peter Van Leishout side we've got Shane Morrison and I'll show you their images shortly about what standard of maintenance uh, rubbish removal and care can be considered when you look at the history of what's actually gone on with the people that are, are responsible for looking after this land. They're called caretakers for a reason. They're the ones that are responsible for taking care of the land. So I've just put on the structures overlay that comes from their appendix G1 on DA21-0010. This was inspected on the ground on the 14th of March 2019. So you have to remember that when you're looking at this, that it is the condition uh, nearly two years ago now. But also in 2019, Mark McMurtry had been living on the land since, I believe, uh, late 2015, early 2016. And what, as one of the few that didn't get kicked off the land, was appointed by the court as the caretaker. Uh, they wanted him to pay rent there, but he said, I'm taking care of the place, so, you know, I'm not going to pay rent. Well. We, We've seen what kind of care he does take care. They should have made him pay rent. They would have actually been able to afford to get rid of the rubbish that he didn't care to take care of. Now, Mark McMurtry is the one that is actually shouting the loudest about do no harm, coming back to country and all this. Well, turning the land, the country, into a rubbish tip is causing harm leaving rubbish, rusty old vehicles that could house any number of rodents and vermin and explode in a bushfire causing an even greater spread of a bushfire through that explosion. I mean, how is it that any of your maintenance or lack of maintenance practices are in line with the principle of do no harm? What have you done? about removing this rubbish. All of the other things that have been causing harm to the land, what have you done to remove them? Nothing. I guarantee you that pile's bigger, not smaller. And while we've got this image up, herein lies another problem with the community. 392 houses that it costs too much to go to the tip they don't have a way to get it to the tip so they make their own tip 392 places and if you can say well no that's not supposed to be I mean there are too many examples of you can even drive past people's places where this actually looks neat compared to what they have just got laying around in their front yard. Some places actually look like they have set up a wrecking yard in it. 
because of all the abandoned vehicles breaks down leave it go get another one breaks down leaves it go get another one until you end up with a graveyard of cars or other broken down things and everything just becomes an extension of a larger tip I wish I could say it was different uh, but there it certainly is there are a, also a lot of examples of people that love the land care about the land and it brings a smile to your face when you go past you know to 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 feel the love that they've put in the land because all you're seeing is the land not this you now this indicates a certain level of apathy towards the land if you're going to treat it like that and any number of those things i mean if you talk about plastic bags and all the other things that can get stuck in animals um, windpipes or you know they eat them and cause them damage what about any of the wildlife that may go through this what damage it may cause to them you know these are things that they just don't consider but they have said do no harm and with Shane's place over here he, he hasn't even moved his pile of rubbish to down the road. Mind you, there's probably not many places he can hide his rubbish because if you have a look at where he is, there's the Misty Mountains tourist cabins up here. You've got tourists coming up there all the time. So he can't go and dump his rubbish anywhere up through there because then they'd come and complain to him and it's he, him that's actually done it or they or worse they could go to Peter Van Lysch out over here and complain that people have been dumping rubbish he could try and go somewhere up through here but anywhere he tries to dump his rubbish like Mark McMurtry has is going to get Peter Van Lysch out his boss a little bit upset with him so he has it outside his house and he also has it outside his shed. He's got to leave enough room to get the car in. But, yes, yeah, all of that that's spilled out into the shed. And then we've got the other one. Oh, no, that wasn't that one, sorry. That's the um, pesticides that you should be worried about that might end up in your water catchments. They're just one of them anyway. So this issue of the current lack of maintenance by the people that would still be there with the development and what could be expected to be continuing, continuing and ongoing lack of maintenance. It's also something that the Tweedshire Council has noted is common and especially where there is a high level of unemployment in that community which there would be there's no jobs in the area they are not offering any jobs they are bringing people into the area and there is no jobs for them it's really just as simple as that some may be able to work from home create self-employment opportunities but of the community maybe only 10 15 percent at generous would be able to do that Many would end up relying, end up be relying on some kind of Centrelink payment. And in that, they cannot contribute to their share of maintenance ongoing roads. Because one of the ongoing costs, these are all dirt roads. Every summer, they are going to get washed out. And a lot of them are going to be, need to be regraded. So before you even put your first house down on there, you may have years of regrading the road just to maintain them in after the, the rains have come through and everything. So there's no anticipation. There's the one-off cost of 18-odd 18 18 million to widen the roads. But even in widening those roads, you will still have to be ongoing maintenance of those roads during the whole construction phase especially during the wet seasons when the roads are 
getting washed out. And that's just going to be a necessity. Some parts of these roads will, every year, need regrading. And that's before you even get people in houses on there. Let me show you an example of what happens when you don't do that. You end up with a washout that is so severe that uh, you can't reconstruct that area. So if you don't keep regrading and regrading, you're going to end up with that. And that can actually happen within a short amount of time when it starts to rain. People have experienced these conditions in this area and the surrounding area. And they can be extremely dangerous. So that's actually not anything that I've raised in this circumstance or any others, is how dangerous all of these dirt roads are actually going to be. When it's dry, there's going to be lots of dust. That's going to clog up. You know, most people are going to be far close enough to the road where they're going to get a bit of that dust come onto them. It's going to come up. And, well, the, the point of fact being, too, is that all that dust going up is going to end up back on the plants, suffocating the plants. It rains, it ends up in the water catchment. Then it, it may explain why some of these dams are so heavily full of sediment too because of the, the dirt that has wound up there off the roads during levels of high activity. And you could anticipate that continued high level of sedimentation with full domestication and all these dwelling lots filled. So a lot of the things that are already existing on these parcels of land are under two caretakers, Mark McMurtry and Shane Morrison. And they have not done what I would consider to be a diligent job in taking care of the land. And I certainly do not anticipate that anything that is promised in a development application would be fulfilled or lived up to. Because we've seen that, well, you need to have a legal DA and application approval to even break the ground. But at Christmas time down here, they did exactly that. All here and over here. It didn't matter that it was illegal. They went ahead and did it anyway. So the respect for the laws isn't there. The ethos, morality of the developers is not even in alignment with the local community or ordinary people. This development is very much opposed by the local community, the broader community, and the local council. And yet, despite this, the developers will force, in any way, shape or form, their agenda onto the larger community. They have not given any care to the impact that it will cause all the people that are already living here. The people that may actually come to Mebane Springs over here, the nice, quiet, reasonable little subdivision of 70 lots. No dramas, no problems. You know, it's just a nice, neat little rural residential area. Not too big and will provide enough housing if you can afford to buy into it and build on it. And in those lots down there, you don't have to be a political extremist. You don't have to be um, a vegan. You don't have to hold certain beliefs or anything. You just have to be a law-abiding citizen. You can get electricity, water, <laughs> and uh, all the other services. And you know another thing you can get? You can get a title that actually has your name on it and says it's yours. Other than that, you know, over the road you're going to pay, well, what will end up 
increasingly been more than what people will pay to get into Mebbin Springs and you will have no legal title over anything for the money you paid. And if you are convinced that you can build a house without certification, try and sell it without that certification because as noted by council, it is a long-standing common problem that in trying to get out of the community, trying to, to pass your unapproved dwelling onto somebody else doesn't work very well. You might be able to get away with it, but in the long run when you want to get something back for it, that's when you find the problems. So these are the 392 exclusive use lots. And those ones that are in orange cannot feasibly be 2.47 acres. There is no possible way that they can be given the location that the developers have put the houses on. They cannot be any different. So I have designed these lot sizes according to where they've put the houses and how they may fit in. Of course, they're these ones may be more over this way, may be different shaped, but in basic essence it was an exercise to see if the promise of 2.47 acres could be fulfilled within each allocated proposed lot. And as I discovered, 40 of those lots cannot fulfill that prerequisite. 40 of those lots can only be an acre. Uh, you may change this one down here and may make it a 39. You might be able to extend that out. But given that these exclusive use areas are only denoted by the house, these ones also may go over here. But I doubt it because they've actually moved the road to come in underneath the road that goes past the house because they don't want people driving past their house all the time. No, they just want them driving past your house all the time. Now this is the flora overlay. I'm sorry if I actually make it more opaque, you won't actually see where all the areas are. And it is actually a little bit overwhelming, but I have discussed this in a previous video, where these one acre lots that will all be cleared are destroying a large part of vulnerable and endangered flora and if you look throughout the development there are very few places left that the development won't encroach upon there's a bit here there there up here around there but everything else all the oh there's one there there's a few, yes, but they're, they're in amongst the, the dwelling locations. See, everything that they propose to put in will destroy something in some way. And it completely goes against their big sales pitch about, oh, how we're so connected to Mother Nature and, you know, come back to country and come back to heart and do no harm. I'm sorry, but it's the biggest amount of bullshit I've ever heard come out of someone's mouth in one sitting. So on the flora side, they will be destroying this complete habitat just to stick up all those houses. They will also be destroying over 300 acres just to put in the rest of the houses and also to widen the road in the vicinity of... Um, 50,000 uh, 50, square metres at least of trees, plants, bushes, whatever's on the side of the road that's going to get widened and removed. And then in further to that, their desire to actually push all the animals that currently use this area over into this little area here. It, it's a, com a completely unacceptable marginalization of their habitat you, you're going in and you're destroying so much 
And then you're saying, well, now we've overtaken all this, you can have this little strip down here because we're not using it. Now the thing I wonder too is that how many road signs will there be on these roads? You know those ones where you see the picture of a kangaroo or some kind of an animal and then you see a car getting turned over? You know those images? Will they be on these roads to warn motorists that there could be the danger of flipping your car and having a car accident because of animals? And who will tend to those injured animals? What kind of provisions have been made to deal with the animals that may be injured trying to cross this busy road? Maybe they're planning to put a veterinary service in over at the village. Maybe not. Maybe they'll have to rely on other local services and rescues that would have to come in from who knows how far away and take so long that ultimately the best thing for it would probably be a bullet. And that's probably why they ask you about how you feel about guns because they will have guns on the property. Now of those houses too, in winter those burning wood fires are going to pollute the area with wood smoke. It's it could become very dense, in, uh, especially in Tasmania, in Launceston. Uh, there were a lot of years people getting asthma attacks and even still now with reg regulations that have changed things, people still have bad health asthma attacks and all these other things that are associated with smoke that sits in an area and condenses. And on still nights up in the top of the mountains, you may well get that. So the question of how many of these houses will be burning smoke, uh, fires and create smoke. Then there's also the aspect of how this larger development can actually be seen from many tourist uh, viewpoints throughout the region. And of a night time you know when you may go and have a look at a view instead of seeing the natural darkness and silhouette of the countryside you may see hundreds and hundreds of lights speckling the hill and likewise the residents round here now I might tell you that from doing night photography that you'll go well you know if they're not in direct sight it's not going to make any difference. Uh, wrong. They actually make light haze and if you have enough uh, places or enough strong light even one strong light in an area it will create a light haze that can actually be seen over the hill. I've photographed it so you know it exists it's a real thing and you've not only got that too but you've also got the noise of all that traffic ongoing traffic in and out of the community all the time that is well and above what all the local residents are actually used to and actually move to the country for the peace and quiet to avoid that kind of activity. Now I have mentioned before about Misty Mountains tourist accommodations not falling within the provisions of the state envir environmental planning policy and also the other undisclosed camping locations that they have throughout the development where they will rent out camping and tourist accommodation. These are not allowed activities within one single lot for multiple owners with multiple dwellings there is to be none of these activities. They are trying to set up essentially a town not a rural land sharing community and if you want to set up a town you need to provide a lot more infrastructure than just leaving this little blue the village area well we're not going to tell you what's going in there because that's part of a separate development application 
and you'll know when that comes out. That's unacceptable. You've intended to provide all these, this overburden on the community and yet no way of how to mitigate it with anything you may intend over here. And I don't think that that is very forthright of the developers to withhold even a basic concept. Now I haven't even talked about the uh, community centres yet and what they are actually supposed to be cons be made of, what, how, what are they supposed to look like. They've got certain structures already existing but they intend to construct community centres. The only way that I can see that these are actually workable is in the initial stage of where people are constructing and they haven't set up any power, electricity, I mean water or anything like that, that there is like an amenities block where they can have a shower, they can go to the toilet, they can do their cooking, they can do their washing, you know, and they can recharge their phone and do all those sorts of things that they can't actually do in their own place. And they can provide that because even though they offer absolutely no electricity to any of these lots, there is electricity poles that run through all the way through to this, these two houses in the middle here and the sawmill. So as a matter that there is power poles and cables, the long-term maintenance of them also needs to be considered. But as the community is not actually using any electricity, it will then become whose responsibility to maintain those power poles and maintenance of them and those um, well, land breaks, fire breaks, where they go through. Who will maintain those? Because you're not offering electricity to the community. The community is not responsible for the power poles or the maintenance of the fire break that they run through. The people that are actually in these houses that are using that electricity would be responsible for that. But then one would also assume that they are community members as well. So would that be then something that all these 392 community members would have to pay for maintenance on the power poles that they can't actually use? All right, so I just put the power on so that you could see. There's also telecommunications cabling. They're the orange bits throughout the property that already exist there and the other ones, the purple one, is actually electricity. As you can see, electricity runs all the way up through here to the centre of the property. And yet none of the locations that would they would propose to put a community centre except for here actually would be within where these power poles go through. Let me just put that on. So here we have the locations of the community centres. One here, one here. As I said, this one is the only one that would have any power to it, where it may actually be able to hook into it. And this one over here also may have power be able to hooked into it, but it does not appear, I mean, there must be power going up there, but I have not been able to find any power diagrams that go past here. They have excluded any maps for this area up here, and yet I do believe that there is power to these areas as well. That's actually a communications cable that's going along there, that's not power. Now there is a place here, this one under here, right there, that doesn't have power. But I do believe that these ones do, so uh, their maps, their diagrams are not complete. They do not show the whole entire area, so it is possible that the diagrams that contain the wiring and poles, as you can see here, the poles go up here. 
can see I've marked in all the power poles. Every one of those represents a power pole. So from those power poles you could anticipate, you know, if you wanted to stick in a power pole and a certain amount, well, I know, what, 30, 40 years ago it was 20, 30, 20, yes, thousand to move it so far. So I don't know what it'll be now, but it's a big expense just to get one pole and a bit of cable to it. But that's another area that there's no clear information on all the community centres that they intend to build. What is the actual function of them? Because if you're living here, why would you go up here to the community centre? To meet your friends? Or would you just not go around your friend's place? These community centres would be more designed for events, not for, uh, oh, let's regularly go down to the community centre every night and cook our dinner and talk with our friends down there. And people are going to be living their own lives in their own homes. And the community centres would be accessible for uh, any facilities that they don't have if they actually provided them. And, well... Maybe I should read a bit more of the documents because I still haven't finished reading them all properly yet, but um, it does take time to get through them. And certainly some of the things that I have already said may only be from the perspective that I have actually not discovered them in the documents yet. They may exist somewhere in the documents that I haven't found. So the information I give is based upon what I've been able to cover and look at up until this point. And I'm telling you that it is, it is not exhaustive, it is not all inclusive, it is a progress of discovering what all this information means. Now there's another area that gravely concerns me with this development, is that Adrian Brannock is an undischarged bankrupt. And if anyone's seen any of the other videos about what other activities he's been up to that are less than savoury, it's more than concerning that someone like Adrian Brennock is offering vendor finance to potential investors. He is not disclosing to potential investors that he is an undischarged bankrupt. If you were going to invest in a a multi-million dollar project and you went up to the developer and he said oh before you invest I've got to tell you I'm a bankrupt yeah <laughs> you'd walk away and he knows that and that's why it's very deliberate that he does not disclose what he is required to by law to state that he is an undischarged bankrupt now it would be argued that he doesn't need to because what he's doing is only a job. Well, it is not a job. He is the developer. He is a shareholder through shares that he deliberately and misled the government, the ATO, his bankruptcy hearing, and those movement of shares has been investigated. So he is more than just an employee with no responsibilities and no say. He is a major shareholder, he has got major say, which is why he promotes himself as the developer and says, we own the town. He doesn't say they own the town, he says we. And we is inclusive of Adrian Brennock, who is reaping the rewards of being the developer of Nightcap on Minjimble in many ways, but most notably through Nyepi Proprietary Limited, the shares that he moved into his wife's name that hold interests in other companies within the member companies where he can get money back through, well, where he sees as a legal means. But it's not actually legal to actually hide assets and move them while you're being declared bankrupt. So it is a worrying prospect that someone that has got such a poor financial history that they're actually a bankrupt, an undischarged bankrupt, 
and they want to offer you vendor financing. Well, what kind of a setup could a bankrupt actually think of where you might not actually end up a bankrupt like him? I mean, clearly, if his methods were so effective, he would not have ended up a bankrupt, would he? There's also the heritage sites issue where Mark McMurtry had made specific mention that they would be protected and looked after and away from any development. And yet there is clear indications that that is not the case. And also in doing my due diligence search that 25 results came back on all the 21. Actually, I'd, I searched 23 lots because of the other two that I also wanted to see if there was anything inclusive in those lots. So I searched 23 lots. And of those lots, 25 results came back. And of those 25 results, there were extra results ones that were not mentioned, that were only on what was provided by NCV Enterprises in their report. And then there was the variance between what was on the all the different lot numbers. Like as you can see here, I've said four shown, but the results from the actual due diligence search shows 11. So where are the other seven? And in that sense, there have been six added records that can't be accounted for by the official records and 10 official records that are missing. Plus the addition of these ones as well on, set, on lots that had no recording whatsoever of any heritage artifacts. So I would say, in the very least, that there are questions about whether they have actually successfully covered all the actual listed heritage sites. And why are there so many records missing? And why have they included so many, or for all intensive purposes, made up their own? Now the estimation of what the broader community, well the NICAP on Minjimbal community may be like in traffic, one can actually currently look at the traffic problems being experienced in Mandalay Road and has been for several years as there is a constant flow of traffic up and down. In fact uh, with the recording of vehicles that were done up and down the road today. It's a high volume considering that there's one house here, there's one house here. I don't know, maybe someone might live there that they weren't allowed to get into. There is actually a telecommunications cable there. there that's empty. So the only people that could be going up this road are that person, that person, that person, or Dolph up here in his place. So that's about four other vehicles. It doesn't account for the trucks with excavators and all the other tradies vehicles and all the other vehicles going up and down, dump trucks and all these other things. And uh, that is why this area that Dolph has been, this area where he's made it look like a quarry, where he's landscaped out for whatever he's doing. Let's hope that there will be something that is forthcoming from the council investigations on that soon and we will know what he's been doing up there. Why all these trucks are going up and down. But the level of traffic on this road is something that could be anticipated in the other roads, main access roads leading into the community once it's all established. And under the conditions that it is, this bridge over here is barely coping with all the traffic, as is the road condition that up until a certain time ago 
One of the landowners in the area was helping to maintain the roads, but as he retired and was not bringing home some of that extra stuff that he could just throw there, and it was going to start costing Peter Van Leish out to actually maintain the roads, he did nothing. And in the time that nothing has been done, the roads have just got worse and worse. And you have got the highest level of traffic going over these roads now when they have not been maintained in the condition that this previous um, retiree was able to maintain the condition in. Now the last thing I'm going to finish with here is just a brief summary of well, the illegal works that come off the top of my head that uh, are very easy. That what went on down here at Christmas time, December 2020, to clear this whole hill off and over here. Making it look ready for lots to go in. And also a lot of illegal habitation that went back on in the Bulla Bulla days. A lot of the rubbish that has actually been left over here that you can actually see that was surveyed on the land was actually left behind by those that, well, illegally habited the land and were kicked off by council. And many of those structures that were existing had to be removed. So, uh, yes, a lot of these ones that actually show up as might be a slab or, or uh, looks like a pre-existing structure or whatever, they were. They had structures there and the council um, after they said you cannot live there they refused to listen to them so the council had to take them to court get a court order and through the court order they were ordered to remove all those dwellings and leave the land in which they did and then a lot of those investors were then left to try and get their money back through Wollumbin Horizons and Adrian Brennock that's when he threw it into a fire sale, into liquidation, and also when he started out with his ploy of litigate, 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 to tie people up in litigation. He was even planning on suing one of the lost investors because she might carry insurance that they could actually sue her for and get her to pay for their mistakes. Yes. The character of the developers leaves a lot to be desired. Their moral ethics, well, their lack of them, their, well, psyche, their ability to actually work within some normal framework of understanding in all aspects of their official NICAP on Minjimbal documentary they are political extremists and declare outrightly that the laws of Australia are invalid. The laws of Australia don't apply to them, which is how it's so easy that when they have that perception that the laws don't apply to them, that they just go in and do whatever they want. Illegal habitation, illegal earthworks, illegal threats, it doesn't matter. As long as they feel justified, that it's within their framework of Yadaki principles and their sovereign rights, they do not recognise Australian laws or the citizens that live under them. Essentially, anyone that lives under Australian laws, we shape. You know, we, we just haven't got it figured out like them. And if we want to escape being a sheep, we need to come and join in and live under their mindset go through a very personal questionnaire, tell them what you eat in your own home and what your political views are, and then you can go through well, a, a minimum of five hours interview to see if you're good enough for them in their community. And if you don't say the right thing, you won't be good enough. But if you do say the right thing, in that you show that you are easily pliable and you've got some money that they can take off you, you're in. But they just don't want you to be too diligent and too smart. 
it's going to be a borderline problem for them though because it's actually hard to find somebody that has got a disposable income that w would be able to buy into this because no bank's going to lend money for this. It is anybody that has got anything saved. They may have had an inheritance left to them. They may have had an insurance payout. Whatever the reasons are, they are after the people that have got some kind of a disposable income and are also really not going to check things out too much and question things too much. And up until very sh few weeks ago, there was never a development application. Adrian Brennock and Richard Moat clearly state there is existing approval. Now, there isn't even existing approval on the development application that's just been put in. It's still a lodgement. It's been submitted. It has not been consented to. So no existing approval. And if the existing approval did exist, that Adrian Brannock said and Richard Moat said, well then why did they even need to put in DA21-10? If it already exists, why did they need the approval? And these are things that they have misled people on for a long time. And they are going to continue to do it now and unfortunately there will be too many people now that they have lodged that development application through deceptive means I might add that they're going to think oh well it definitely will be built you know that 150,000 that I've got saved up from my insurance from when my dad died or something like that I'm going to buy into it because this is the best opportunity I can get in a lifetime they're the people that they're looking for and they now will be able to drag them in just that little bit more. Because sadly for them, Pete Evans isn't really drawing in too many investors. The first video they put out with Pete Evans, that drew quite a few thousand. The next one they put out, well, let's just say that the next two after that, weren't even making it up into the triple digits, not even a hundred. Nobody is interested in Pete Evans anymore. And they're not even interested in hearing about his continual failures and how he's hurt people and what his latest harebrained scheme and idea is. They're just not interested. So now that they've actually put this development application in, they will be able to draw people in by, and when they bring them in, they meet them down here at the Mount Burrell Cafe. They come up through here and sitting in the car, they'll be saying, yes, we've cleared this off. You can come and put your thing in there shortly. You can build and everything. You know, it's just a matter of time and you'll be able to build on it. When they don't even know it, they don't have any consideration for the fact that they have just applied for planning approval, development consent under the rural land sharing communities where one lot is only permissible and no subdivision. This development does not fall within the description of a rural land sharing community. As I mentioned earlier, if they divided off all of those different titles had already done that and had 11 titles and put in 11 development applications, that would be fair. But it's not. And it's not now. The current development application is for the existing 21 multiple lots that they intend to subdivide. And that intended subdivision is in contradiction. Concept subdivision, subdivision prohibited. So their concept of what they want to achieve at NICAP on Minjimbal within the framework of the rural land sharing communities is unachievable. You cannot have subdivision. It just is that simple. It's prohibited. It doesn't matter whether you can make provisions and say oh well we've got a concept we can do it this way it's whether it's allowed within the provisions 
of the policy that allows you to actually construct that in the first place. The SCPP is the only legislation that allows this to go up. Without it, they are not allowed to do it. And if the Tweed Shire Council get their way, they will remove their names from the state environmental planning policy and rural or land sharing communities will no longer be able to be applied for through the SEPP in the Tweed Shire Council. The other councils that are still less listed within the policy, you can try and set them up there, but not in the Tweed. So that's a lot of things to consider when there is the application itself doesn't match the requirements set out by the policy. They are intending to even breach the conditions that are clearly stated. It's three pages. It's not rocket science. Subdivision prohibited. And clearly, with that noted, they've still decided, look, we're going to subdivide it anyway. Because we're a law unto ourselves, we'll be able to find a way around it. We'll be able to threaten someone with suing them, or we might be able to pay someone under the table, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. How can you take into consideration the state environmental planning policy and include the concept of subdivision? I'm sorry, but your plan, town planner is just... I don't know. He's obviously trying to make your dreams of and um, fantasy a reality and doesn't want to break it to you that it's actually not within the, the framework of the actual things that are policies. But then your clients don't actually think that policies really matter to them because the Australian laws are invalid, they're illegal, and both adopted tribal people Mark McMurtry and Adrian Brannock state that they have not given up their tribal sovereignty rights and lands. And they never did back then, even though it was probably their relatives coming over on the boat, sticking their toe in the sand and a rag on it. <laughs> but they're the ones now objecting to, we never gave up our sovereignty, pretending like it happened to any of your real ancestors. Mark McMurtry is a tribal fake and he is a tribal skin name thief and if he actually really cared about the tribes he would not have actually set up some kind of tribal claim over the land at Nightcap on Minjimbal he would actually already realize it is an area of contention amongst several tribal um, people that it's theirs, others say no it's theirs and there are at least three to four different people that lay claim on this area and all are as passionately mm, possessive about it as each other. With the indignation that the Minjimbo have dare to got the audacity to claim this land as their own and to set up on their tribal lands. So in the background of all of this, there's a little tribal war brewing too, because that's not gonna last for long. The quiet, sooner or later, um, well, tribal law will find its way. Might also be noted that the real tribal people will not actually live on the land and there's good reason for that. See, the name Wollumbin that's actually been given to the place, and people know it as, as Warning, Mount Warning. Now, it's like if you were walking down the street and you said, hey, Warning, Warning. What? <laughs> it's not anything that... It, it's not the name of the place. It's a warning, okay? Wollumbin is a warning not to go there. And it's, a, it's not a, a place name. It's the definition of what the place is. It's a warning. Don't go there. And depending on which tribe that you actually look at and ask, there are various reasons on why 
there is a warning around that land and you should not go there. But that said, real tribal people will not live in the area that has got the warning on it. And then you can look at the Kunga curse, which goes back to the time when all the people were slaughtered on the land and the clever man came in and put a curse on the land. Mark McMurtry says that he waved a little sage stick round and went, oh, you know, curse fixed. It took a group of clever men to curse the land. Real clever men. Real tribal men. And Mark McMurtry, adopted tribal imposter, waves his little sage stick around and says, all cleansed now, the curse is cleared. That's a load of rubbish. You wouldn't even have the ability to clear the area of what those clever men put on it. Not you or any of your mates combined together because you do not have even the combined power to overcome that which is already there. And also probably a warning that it is doomed to failure. Nothing will succeed on the land. It is part of the curse. You're better off to just turn it over to perpetual trust, give it to the animals and the natural wilderness and let them have it. And thereby it will not affect mankind because he will not be habitating the land. Hmm. The animals will. Because you know what? They need a home too. And on that note, I think I've covered everything. I've tried to pretty much bring up everything that I have in previous videos here before to either touch on them again or uh, uh, I said I wasn't going to detail them but uh, I did anyway didn't I <laughs> some not too much you may have to watch other videos but anyway I think I've as I said I think I've covered everything that I can mention Oh, other than the water bores, that's a concern that I haven't... I've wondered about how they did 17 tests and when those 17 tests were done, they actually clearly were done at a time when 3222, this area, was not part of it because all the water bore locations are on Peter Van Leishout's land. Or maybe... Peter Van Leishout paid for it and he said well I'm not paying for any on your land if you want them you can get them paid for I don't know but this community over here doesn't seem to be getting much access as far as anything's concerned because the way that they looked like they had tried to set it up is the ball locations would would be for uh, you know one cluster of buildings or something like that but it's not and, I, and it may be stated in there, I haven't got to that yet, but at this stage I have not seen anything that's stated what they intend to do with those 17 bore tests. Whether they will actually be the locations, whether they intend to put those 17 in, whether they intend to put in another 30 odd around the place. Uh, it, all it is is just test results. And, yeah, well, it just shows where, if you drill down so far what kind of geology you're going to get. Anyway, as I said, I think I've covered everything now. If I've forgotten something, well, that's another video. <laughs> All right, I'll catch you next time. Bye.